He's a professor at UCO Sashlik Observatory at the Technical Lab in University of California, Santa Cruz. He received his MS and PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Princeton University. Um, his re research is mostly focused on the formation and evolution of galaxies. Uh, the floor is yours, Doctor. Thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me. And uh, let's see if the screen share works. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes. All right. Excellent. Thank you again. Thanks very much for inviting me to be part of this event. It's a real honor. And uh, please give me a, a two-minute warning when my 15 minutes are about to end. Okay. You can just uh, yell it out since I can't see you I have, uh, while I'm on screen share. Okay. So um, I'm going to focus most of this talk on my interests, uh, which is galaxies. And I'll, I'll show you some snippets from Andromeda, our galactic neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy. Um, I'm a professor and department chair of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at UC Santa Cruz. And five years ago, I had the privilege of spending eight months at Google's headquarters in Mountain View as a visiting professor there. So uh, my journey's already been mentioned a little bit. Thank you for that kind introduction. I, I did my high school in Calcutta, India in the Matnia boys, then did my bachelor's degree in physics at St. Davis College in Calcutta. I started a master's degree at the University of Calcutta to get a fourth year of post-secondary education before I applied for and went to Princeton University to get my master's and PhD. I did two postdoctoral research stints, uh, one at Princeton at the Institute for, both at Princeton actually, one at the Institute for Advanced Study in, in Princeton, one at, back at Princeton University. And then for a year, I was employed at the Space Telescope Research Science Institute that controls the Hubble Space Telescope. And that was in Baltimore before joining the University of California, Santa Cruz, 26 years ago, 1994. Um, I had one goal in life when I was um, the age of most of the audience. When I was in high school, I wanted to be an artist. And I wanted to be a graphics artist, designing logos, designing, uh, doing work, uh, for companies that wanted to advertise. That's what I wanted to do. Um, my plan B was to be a scientist, be a researcher. And I went, cycled through, first wanting to study biology or medicine, then chemistry, then physics, and then astrophysics. So it goes without saying that I'm living my plan B. I'm not living my plan A. So um, I grew up in a big city of Calcutta and Calcutta is about as light polluted as you can imagine. And not just light polluted, the skies were thick with factory smog, vehicular uh, pollution. So I never got to see the Milky Way like you're seeing in the picture in front of you. Uh, the only way I got to see the night sky was by seeing a representation of the night sky at a planetarium in my city. And that planetarium had more of an impact on me than if I had grown up in a city where I could look up and, or grown up in a place where I could just look up and see the night sky. So I was really inspired by uh, the night sky by, ironically, by walking into a building. And uh, it was not until I went for a trek in the Himalayan foothills, uh, shortly before I left for graduate school, near the, near, near the time I was finishing college, that I saw the Milky Way in all, all its glory far away from city lights. And I, what I wanted to show you is a brief movie that a friend of mine, a physics teacher at uh, Castle School in Palo Alto put together. This is a time-lapse movie of the Milky Way that he put together using a digital SLR, wide field digital SLR, taking pictures every 30 seconds. He put together this movie that you're about to see. I'll remove the label so you can focus on the, on the movie itself. And you can see uh, shooting stars and lightning and the apparent rotation of the Milky Way as the earth spins. You can see clouds going by. You can see the tree shuttering in the breeze. You can see light, someone turning the lights off so that the, you no longer see the tree. But uh, seeing the Milky Way was uh, a moment that I, I'll never forget. Seeing the Milky Way like a fluorescent lamp in the, in the sky was a moment I'll never forget. And perhaps right then, some switch got turned on that said, you know, the visual beauty of the night sky found some resonance in the part of me that wanted to be an artist. And I decided that um, in college that I would become an astronomer. And uh, it, a few years after that, when I was uh, finished my PhD, I uh, 
went to an observatory and my students, collaborator and I, took this image. What you're seeing here is not a single image, but uh, four representations of a mosaic of 57 images. You can sort of see the scalloped images, or scalloped edges of the mosaic on the right, but these are four different contrast levels of looking at the Andromeda galaxy through a digital device using a, one of the early digital cameras. The first digital mosaic of the Andromeda galaxy it was put together, like I say, and not just by me, but my students and me. Andreas and Phil were my students, and Shomak was a collaborator of mine. We put this together. But this was also became a turning point in my life. Seeing this picture, the beauty of this galaxy, made me want to study it more. And um, today, and in, indeed for the last two decades, I've been studying the Andromeda galaxy using a telescope in Hawaii, whose picture is about to appear here. Um, the, you see two telescopes. They are located on a mountaintop in, in Hawaii on Mauna Kea. And I've been using these two telescopes to study uh, the Andromeda galaxy. I've also been using the Hubble Space Telescope that's shown in cartoon form in the lower left there um, to study a portion of the Andromeda galaxy. The portion is marked in the, with this white outline. And this is part of a project that's called PHAT, Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury, led by a colleague of mine, Julianne Del Canton at the University of Washington. And I, what I'll show you next is the detail, some of the details of the Hubble image of this segment of Andromeda. Okay, so what you're about to do is we're gonna zoom into Hubble's image of Andromeda. Andromeda is right there, this galaxy two and a half million light years away. This arc of gas, dust, and stars is our own Milky Way. But I'll again remove the label. And as we zoom in, um, this is, you're going to see the details of the Hubble Space Telescope's images of the Andromeda galaxy. So, you know, you can no longer see the arc of the Milky Way, but you can see Andromeda in, in greater and greater detail. And as we zoom in, you'll see the kind of detail the Hubble Space Telescope can provide on the Andromeda galaxy. Now, what you're seeing here is not an artist's impression. It's the actual image, segment of the actual image of a dense field of stars in the Andromeda galaxy. Stars of different temperature are shown with different colors in this map. The bluish white stars are very young. The reddish stars tend to be older. Our sun um, has many analogs in the Andromeda galaxy. So um, what I started to get more and more interested in is the collision between galaxies. Galaxies can actually collide. And uh, I'll show you uh, a little animation that some of my colleagues have put together because galaxy collisions take a long time, so we can't study them in real time, but computer simulations can be compared to snapshots of galaxy collisions. Now I'm gonna remove the label so you can focus on the movie itself. It's an animation where we bring together two computer models of galaxies and right before they, their gravity causes them to intersect, we stop the computer animation and here are two real galaxies that are about to collide. We go back to our computer animation and the mutual gravity of the two galaxies brings them closer together and they start to intersect. And when, while they're intersecting, we stop the computer simulation, change our perspective right there. Here is a second pair of real galaxies that are actually intersecting that are further along than the first pair. We go back to our computer simulation and you see the two galaxies stretching each other out. We stop the computer simulation Here's a third pair of galaxies that are further along than the first two in the collision process. We go back to our computer simulation. The two main bodies of the galaxy start to fall back together due to their mutual gravity. And right before they collide, we stop the computer simulation, change our perspective. And here's a fourth pair of galaxies that are even further along in the collision process. Back to our computer simulation, the two main bodies remerge. And when they do, the black holes at their centers merge as well. And again, we stop the computer simulation, change our perspective, and here's a fifth pair of galaxies going through collisions. So galaxy collisions are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And I started to get more and more fascinated with them. Now you might be thinking, you know, galaxy collisions are fine. Why do we care? Well, I'll talk a little bit next about the discovery, some discoveries made by our group in uh, 2005, we discovered that the Andromeda galaxy 
you know, while it seems like a small speck here, is five times bigger than people previously gave it credit. Okay, so people thought it was 100,000 light years in diameter. We saw that no, it's at least 500,000 light years in diameter. So, you know, imagine waking up and finding you're five times bigger than you thought you were. You're gonna bump into things in your bedroom. You know, so, and this realization that galaxies are so big and galaxies bump into each other are related. So in um, 2005, we made this discovery of Andromeda size. In 2012, my colleagues and I made another discovery about Andromeda, which is about its direction of motion. We found that Andromeda is heading straight for us, straight for us, you know. So um, uh, this was, discovery was made using the Hubble Space Telescope. So NASA put out a press release and about the future Milky Way Andromeda galactic collision. Again, I'll remove the label so you can focus on the, on the movie version that NASA put together of the future. So two billion years from now, Andromeda will look much bigger. And four billion years from now, the two galaxies will actually start interacting with each other. So this is what our future holds for us. Uh, spectacular cosmic fireworks in the sky. You know, we, won't be, we won't live long enough to see these, but our future generations will get to enjoy this. Okay, now with that said, let me say a little bit about the centers of galaxies when they collide. Black holes uh, that are um, located in the hearts of galaxies merge with a black, corresponding black hole in the heart of the other galaxy. And what I'm about to show you is a little movie where we're going to zoom into the heart of a galaxy that's close to us, not Andromeda, a different galaxy, the Messier 87 galaxy. And as you zoom in, you see this real concentration of light. And physicists have built models of what might be going on near the center. What you're about to see is a model, not an actual image, but a model of material swirling around a black hole, material being ejected at very high speed. That's what that white jet of material is. And these black holes have become another source of interest for me. So of course, the phenomenon of black holes has been known for a long time. And this recent image from a couple of years ago of a silhouette of a black hole taken with the Event Horizon Telescope has really fired up people's imagination of what black holes can do to bend light, for example. And of course, the concept of a black hole was brought together by these two people. Albert Einstein in 1912 published his theory of general relativity, the early version of that. And Carl Schwarzschild, his collaborator, showed that if you have a massive enough point, it can bend and trap light. I'm bringing up these people because I feel a strong sense of connection to both of them. Here's why. In 1912, there was a, a, an important moment, of course, for Einstein's life, but it was also an important moment for Carl Schwarzschild because uh, his wife gave birth to their son, Martin. You see a picture of Martin right here. Uh, Martin, this picture of Martin is taken uh, when he's in his 60s. I got to know Martin Churchill when he was in his 70s and 80s possibly, when I was a graduate student at Princeton. Martin was a professor at Princeton and had retired, but was still actively working with students and he became one of my mentors. He had stories about his father's work. His father died when Martin was only a few years old. Carl Churchill died when he was in his 30s. But Martin remembers Albert Einstein visiting their home after his father's death, after his closest collaborator passed away, Einstein visited his collaborator's home to visit his widow and his son, Martin. So I feel a one degree of separation from Albert Einstein because of Martin Churchill. And when I was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study, I met three other people, Freeman Dyson, John Wheeler, and Lyman Spitzer, who all knew Albert Einstein when he was a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, speaking of uh, degrees of separation, here's another uh, famous person who's worked on black holes, who's, I was fortunate enough to go to one of his lectures. This is Stephen Hawking. And um, I really want to, uh, my last sort of image slide is of three people. Vera Rubin on the left is the person who discovered the presence of dark matter in galaxies. She was one of my mentors when I was in graduate school. My first paper was about the kinematics of galaxies. And Vera's work was truly inspiring to me. She gave me excellent feedback on the work I was doing. Another person who was a true inspiration to me is Subramanian Chandrasekhar. Chandrasekhar, as it turns out, is my great grand advisor. What do I mean by that? My PhD advisor, Jim Gunn, got his PhD at Rice University. His PhD advisor was Guido Munch. 
Munk's PhD advisor at the University of Chicago was Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. Now I had the fortune of meeting Chandrasekhar in person when he came to visit Princeton. And again, very inspiring role model. My final role model I'd like to mention is Mother Teresa. I met her for all of 30 seconds when I was in the city of Calcutta. But to see a frail 80 year old person in standing in front of you, to see the physical frailty, but to be aware of the immense impact, power, charisma she had was an inspirational moment for me. This is one of my paintings. This is my oil painting uh, portrait of Mother Teresa. So in closing, let me offer these five, six bits of advice. Follow your heart. Doesn't matter how improbable uh, the thing is that your heart is telling you to do, follow it. Uh, you'll never know what will turn out. My heart told me to become a graphic artist. I never did that. I never was able to do that. And I regret it uh, until, um, uh, regret it every day of my life. I really enjoyed being a scientist, but every chance I get, I get my art fix whenever I can. Uh, be curious, be observant about the world uh, around you. You'll be amazed at what you can see You'll be amazed at how you can be inspired by the natural world. Use your imagination, use your creativity. I don't believe in the left brain, right brain thing. I think you can be an artist and a scientist at the same time. Uh, I was always inspired by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, work hard, there's no substitute. Those first three things aren't a substitute for hard work. And persevere, don't give up easily. Follow the people who say yes to you. Don't follow the people who say no. And most importantly, seek out people, seek out the people who support your journey. Role models and mentors have been the most important part of my personal journey. Um, I don't know where I am with time, but uh, could the uh, organizers please give me a quick time check? How am I doing? Um, you have two minutes left. Okay. Um, I will spend the last two minutes talking about role models and mentors. Uh, and I'll go back a couple of slides to show you a picture of Martin Schwarzschild. Um, I'll give you an example of the kind of inspirational moments individuals can have. You, know, you can imagine that when you're studying a field like astronomy and you're getting to use the world's most powerful telescopes, it's easy to be completely um, you know, awestruck by those things. You know, the questions in astronomy, questions about the universe are quite literally the biggest questions humanity can ask. And it's very easy to be swayed by that. And I was. It's very easy to be swayed by amazing toys, the most powerful telescopes. But when I look back, it's not those, it's not the toys, it's not the questions, it's the people who've been the most significant part of my journey. Martin, I remember having a lunch with him as a grad student, and he lamented about the state of the profession of astronomy, he lamented about how uh, observational astronomers were being too swayed by people's preconceptions of what the universe should look like. He said, you know, you should go out there with an open mind. You should go use a telescope. You should look because it's never been looked at before. You know? And this piece of advice that he gave me on just one afternoon on a hot uh, Princeton summer is something I'll carry with, uh, with me for the rest of my life, something I give to my students as I uh, go through my journey. I think about Stephen Hawking and I think about the incredible physical obstacles he overcame. Incredible physical obstacles. Doctors gave him just a couple of years to live, but he inspired the world with his mind uh, where uh, in a way that is unimaginable. I think about Vera Rubin and all of the obstacles she faced as a female astronomer asking to use a telescope. People didn't give her the opportunities that they gave male astronomers in those days. Um, the obstacles that Chandrasekhar faced, uh, the races that he faced, the obstacles he faced, uh, incredible. The obstacles Mother Teresa faced. Were in, she grew up poor. She grew up in a foster home. And yet she grew up to change the world. You know, most of us don't have, can't even imagine obstacles like that. Um, so again, I want to end on the note of people. I want to end on the note of role models. And I'll close by putting up this slide one more time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your time.